Hello and welcome to today's Spotlight on Senior Issues. This is a series of programs where we are addressing um, the fastest growing uh, segment of our population, the senior citizens. And I'm Kelly Hook, a certified senior advisor. And with me today is Shanna Johnson. She is a hospice care consultant for Hospice Compasses. We're happy to have you today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Good deal. A lot of people have uh, just many different questions regarding hospice care and, and um, a lot of people are kind of afraid of hospice care. So right at the front, um, why don't you just give us sort of a definition of hospice care and then speak a little bit to um, who might be appropriate or, or when do you like to get calls for hospice care? Sure. Um, hospice care is designed for anyone that has a terminal and or a non-curable disease. Okay. Um, you're right. People are very afraid of the word because they, they think of hospice as the very end and it's giving up and they can't have any, any sort of treatment that's going to um, prolong their life, Make so to speak. Better. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, really, that's not, that's not actually the case. Um, hospice care is, uh, can be utilized within several months and sometimes years before um, the end, very end stage comes okay. along. Okay. And so we like to have our patients on at least referred and get a baseline of what's going on with them at the time of, of the disease um, assessment and prognosis right. because at that, at that time we're able to really give them the full benefit of the entire scope of what we can do to give them the best quality of life. Okay, so so let's say somebody's in the hospital and has, has been diagnosed with a cancer diagnosis of some sort. Um, they can actually have a hospice consultation um, prior to being admitted to hospice or just to get the idea of what, when it might be an appropriate time. Let's say maybe they're not ready to be on hospice yet. Is that something you all yes, can do? Yes, absolutely. We, okay. we, we actually ask our physicians and our hospitals to allow that informed decision if they just want to know more about the benefit, okay. if they're appropriate, what their, what their choices are at that time. Um, we can come in at any time and do an assessment and okay. explain what it is that we do, what their goals are, and that's how we want to deem any service that we're providing to our seniors is what do you want, what do you want the outcome to be? Do you, are you focused on uh, comfort measures? Are right. you focused on getting aggressive treatment if you have cancer? Are you wanting to do chemotherapy and, and uh, radiation? Or are you looking strictly to look at palliative and, and comfort measures only? Comfort measures, right. And so we kind of mentioned cancer, but hospice is not just for cancer. Hospice is for many other illnesses and even just um, um, talk about some of those. When might, what might be a condition that is hospice appropriate? It is, a great, it is a great myth and a little bit of a misconception. Even when I started in hospice care, that was my mindset as well. Right. You are, you are diagnosed with cancer. Cancer. Mm -hmm. And it's usually you have a, a few days and sometimes a few hours. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a lot of the mindset of, of many, many, many People. people. population. It is. Right. It is. That's not, that's not the case. We have um, several diagnoses that qualify someone for the benefit of hospice. Okay. Um, besides the cancer, there are a lot of chronic diseases that, that are ultimately terminal, which are COPD and CHF. So that would be like lung diseases. Lung disease, okay. um, heart disease, okay. kidney disease, liver disease, neurological diseases, a lot of Alzheimer's dementia, okay. Parkinson's, okay. ALS, depending on there there's very specific criteria that we look at to see if someone is eligible for hospice right. benefit and they have to meet those guidelines right and you have to assess them they have to be assessed by a nurse or a doctor from that you have to have how do they get approved for hospice the nurse will do a, an assessment right. and an evaluation um, per a doctor's order okay so okay. anyone can refer anyone can ask us to do an evaluation we can't do a clinical hands-on we do rely on our physicians to give us the orders to do that but. okay okay so um, talk to me a little bit more about the Alzheimer's dementia piece because I know in my area of expertise with seniors we do deal and it seems like more and more we're dealing with a large population of people that either have you know a, a true diagnosis of Alzheimer's or maybe a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. And, you know, we know the dementia umbrella sort of covers a lot of different types of dementias. 
Um, a lot of uh, our patients that have Parkinson's also have dementia with the Parkinson's. So I know that Alzheimer's in and of itself is not necessarily a hospice diagnosis, but how do you all go about um, assisting families that are in, in truly a crisis situation with, with their Alzheimer's and dementia patients? Okay, I'll go back and address the first part of what you okay. said. Um, Alzheimer's is, is a, set, a standalone um, hospice eligible disease. Okay. However, usually if it's typically just Alzheimer's with nothing else going on, it is a very end stage uh, progression. Okay. They are usually not ambulatory, they're incontinent of bowel and bladder, which means they're not, right. have no control over that and they are usually not a able to speak intelligibly. Okay. You know, th th if you ask a question, they're not going to be able to come back, understand the question that was asked, and then give intelligible response. Right. So coupled with that, however, if there's anything else, and this is what we, we try to explain, even, even educating our, our, our healthcare community, right. is that there we can't we aren't just looking at a specific disease. Exactly. We're looking at everything that's going on with so that person. So the whole person, picture. The whole yeah. picture. So they may not meet a specific criteria for one specific disease, such as Alzheimer's, but they may be having recurrent infections, or they may sure. be having weight loss, or they in may be in and out of the hospital, any okay. of those things will qualify you. So with the Alzheimer's dementia, as you know, it's growing, yes. and it's going to continue to grow. Um, it's going to be very, very prevalent and continue to be very prevalent. Mm -hmm. And so what we, what we really want to do is be proactive in getting these families some resources and some yes. options in place before they get in a crisis situation. Right. And so even if it's a situation, and you deal with this all the time with your company too, they may not be appropriate for one specific thing, but how can we help you reach the goals of keeping your loved one either at home or helping you with placement if they need to be in a facility or a residential care or an assisted living, that sort of thing. And help them meet those goals. And help so them meet those goals. I think with an, uh, especially with Alzheimer's and dementia, meeting with, with your team earlier rather than later, even to understand um, and have some resources with the progression as it progresses is probably really, really it's, important. It's a huge, it's a huge piece of the puzzle. So talk to me a little bit about your team. Um, what, what resources do you all have at Hospice Compasses that are available for your clients um, and their families? Because I, I know I've been really impressed with the different resources, um, social worker, chaplain, that kind of thing. So how do those all play into the team approach to hospice care, which I think is really important, and then assist the families as they're going and, and the clients as they're going through this time? It's truly a collaborative effort. The team is, is consisted of the, the uh, following the attending physician, whoever right. the physician is that's following their care. We also have a hospice care physician that is certified in hospice and palliative medicine. Okay. We have our, um, our nurse case managers. We have our nurse aides. We have our social worker. We have our chaplains. We have our volunteers. Um, and even on top of that and more so, we call it our interdisciplinary team. Right. But if the, the family, if the patient is in a facility, then that facility and their staff are part of our team as well. The families are part of our mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. The Anybody that is collaborating in a plan of care for that individual is really part of this to collaborative team. To the team. They do. So that brings up a point. You said something about... Um, care in a in a facility where can you get hospice care where you know what do you have to be at home no you can get you can receive hosp the hospice benefit wherever you reside okay um the usually most people want to be at home some do not and some can't some don't have the caregiver services right. for it or the financial resources for it um, if they are in a nursing home, if they're in an assisted living facility, if they're in a residential care facility, if they're in senior housing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't if matter. they're appropriate for the benefit, the benefit is their their right to have no matter where they are. So, where, so that would be a situation where you would be pulling in, you know, if they were like in an assisted living or a nursing home, you would be pulling in the team there at the facility to make sure that everybody was kind of on the same page with the goals for the for the patient. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And we do work hand in hand with the with all of the facilities and there are times when it's more appropriate for a patient to be in a facility on a, on a skilled bed right. and we won't get into all the, the details of, of skilled versus hospice benefit but one thing we I feel like we pride ourselves in is making sure that we are overall doing what's best for, for that patient. patient. 
for the patient, for their family. Um, so tell me something about um, how, how do these services get paid for? Medicare is, reimburses the hospice companies. So if you're over 65 um, on Medicare, definitely is a Medicare benefit. You absolutely are entitled to the Medicare benefit. There's a Medicaid benefit for hospice as well. There's okay. a VA benefit for hospice. Most commercial insurances also have a hospice, hospice benefit. benefit. And there are some, you know, we don't deny people services. There are, we get together with our team if there's no payer source and see what it is that we can do. So you all do, I know, I've, I've heard do some volunteer services for people who don't have insurance and can't afford the service. We do. So that, that's really an exciting thing that you all do. Um, so one of the things I thought was interesting is um, you, you don't necessarily um, pass away on hospice. There's actually some real good stories of people actually improving on hospice. Talk a little bit about that. It's, it's true, we call it, you, you're graduating from hospice. Um, and In a good way. It is a good way, and, and to preface that a little bit, a lot of physicians are a little bit leery that people are afraid of, of certifying somebody at a six month or less prognosis. Mm -hmm. What Medicare will tell you is, you meet the, if you meet the criteria, we're doing an assessment, you meet the criteria, you are appropriate for the benefit. Um, a good guideline for our physicians is to say, if someone continues on a decline that they're on right now, from A to Z, would it be possible that their lifespan is six months? And mm -hmm. that's really kind of where that goes. A lot of times, as you know, with the trajectory of a disease and good right. days and bad days, with the quality of care, the socialization, mm -hmm. especially on a disease that, that tends to be a little bit more chronic and maybe they plateau, we continue to assess. They have to continue to meet criteria for the benefit. Mm -hmm. If they rally and they are really doing well and they're gaining weight and they're being ambulatory, right. and their disease really has kind of plateaued, we will look at saying, you probably do not need the benefit anymore. And so at that time, we, you know, we do a recertification assessment mm -hmm. and decide um, with the team and with the physician and the family, is it appropriate for you to continue with the benefit? Yeah, I remember a couple of years ago, we had a a mutual um, client and and he actually was on service for several months maybe even you know eight months to ten months and we had hospice care with him but we also had the private duty caregivers and because he was a, a single little elderly man who wasn't eating correctly he wasn't really taking his medications the way he should have um, once he got to where he was taking his medications correctly and eating because the caregivers were cooking for him and he was seeing the nurse from hospice, um, I was going over there and checking on him as well. He actually got to feeling a whole lot better and his disease was more under control and he wasn't having as much shortness of breath. And it was kind of surprising for me that he actually did graduate off of hospice um, and it was kind of a, a different flavor for me to see somebody that actually was doing better because of the care that he was getting and I was really happy about that so and I'll tell you um, another another segment to that is that you would think that people would be really ecstatic to come off of service right? <laughs> but a lot of the time they're just distraught <laughs> because they don't want to come off the service they don't want to lose, lose all, the benefit. all the benefits and, and they don't lose the benefit okay. indefinitely that's one of the points i want to make um, when you talk about the financial side of things we don't for everything that we do that's that's covered with hospice care that's in the scope of what what hospice care allows we do not charge a copay so okay. everything that we do um, medications that are related equipment supplies those sorts of things are all inclusive, inclusive. of the hospice benefit okay. and if they do come off service if they do graduate from the benefit um, there is no set time frame if they took a nosedive two hours later they could come right back two days on service. And, and a lot of times we see within a couple weeks that people will just and and we do stay in touch with them we don't just say well we're mm -hmm. done we right. don't see you right. later um, but but there are a lot of times where you will see an overall decline whenever that that quality of care or making sure the medications and things like that um, aren't quite as efficient maybe as mm -hmm. they had right. had been well there's a couple questions I had about choosing a hospice my um my grandmother, we kind of had a bad hospice experience. And I think, you know, oh, sorry. there's more than 
one person that's probably in our audience listening today that has had a bad experience and the reason is one of the reasons I feel and I'm a nurse so um, when my mom was was given the hospice option um, at the hospital my grandma wasn't doing well they presented her with about a four page booklet of names that of companies starting from A and going to Z and my mother's not a medical person and she didn't know really anything about hospice care and she started looking at the page and honestly she told me and this is her testimony she said Kelly I just picked I picked a hospice kind of on an eeny meeny miny mo and started going down the list and I looked for a nice sounding name and I really had no information on these hospices I didn't know who they were and, and I, I picked one to call and the first one I called didn't answer so I went to the next one that sounded good on the list and they picked up the phone and so we ended up with this hospice now when I heard about mom's uh, uh, way of choosing hospice care I decided that that didn't sound to me like the right way to pick a hospice so tell us tell the listeners what is a good way to pick you know this is such a um, an important time of life it is important that it is a great decision that people do not look back on and uh, have regrets on um, it's important that they feel like they are being cared for appropriately and that their needs are being met how can we pick better <laughs> Than just that's a great, looking that's at a great, the list. <laughs> that's a great question, and and everyone is afforded choice. And I think our healthcare community is great about putting that choice out there. Mm -hmm. I do think that sometimes there are questions that need to be asked yes. that people don't know and realize. Right. I would say first of all, talk to talk to your neighbors, talk to your friends, talk to your healthcare providers. Ask them what their experiences have been with the hospices that they work with. Ask okay. them who you know maybe narrow it down who should we talk with maybe we need to talk to more than one and see right because I, I do feel like that there are different things mm -hmm. that some agencies do that stand out that are kind of over and above beyond right. what right. you have maybe. to provide for mm -hmm. hospice care ask if there are volunteers if, if that's something that that's you really need question, yes. need assistance with ask if you have respite contracts with all of the facilities and or hospitals do you have that in place to be able to afford utilizing a, a benefit. A respite contract. A respite contract is is having a, a situation, a contractual um, establishment in place with a long-term care facility and or a hospital where if a caregiver needs a break, okay. if they need oversight of care, and maybe a, maybe a caregiver gets sick or any of these things that may happen, okay. where can we go? And, and have my loved one have some 24-hour oversight of care. 24-hour care so you can have a break and maybe even get some sleep. Yes, Could and we, we pay for that. We pay okay. for that respite care up to five days, typically a month, okay. whatever. Everybody's different in what their needs are. But I would ask about that. I would ask about some of the, the services that, that are offered, some of the grief support groups and okay. bereavement um, support that, that's offered pre and post uh, a Make sure that passing. there's programs in, on both sides. Right. Okay. Right. Um, and word of word of mouth is you know word of mouth is irreplaceable when it comes to experiences. Right. And my biggest um, my biggest advice I would say even even when you choose a hospice is don't be afraid to don't be afraid to voice things that you need or concerns that you have right. because I think a lot of a lot of experiences um, not everyone. Not not every experience, and and nobody is perfect, even mm -hmm. though Absolutely they strive to be. Not, yeah. But a lot of times, I would say, people don't want to burden someone with mm -hmm. something that really may be needed. Right. And so they become overwhelmed, and they become stressed, and very anxious. And sometimes, we can pick up on it, and right. other times, we need you to flat out say, say "Yeah." I need help with this and let's figure out a way to do it. Well and, and I think a lot of people think that you know if they pick uh, one specific hospice and they're not happy with it there is a choice I mean they can actually move to a different hospice um, I suggested my parents actually do that that my mom actually and it was funny to me because the response was well you know grandma's comfortable in the bed we have to change the bed out we have to change all our equipment it was almost like the act of actually changing to a different hospice 
was going to cause more disruption, more, you know, uh, anxiety for my mom and she felt like for her mom mm -hmm. um, than just sticking with what they had even though they weren't happy with it. Um, do you have any guidance or <laughs> help it's, for that? It's, it seems to be that, that, again, it goes back to I don't want to burden or I don't yes. know. I, I really relate it to the same as you're bringing a child into the world. Yes. You're going to have a doctor in a hospital that you feel comfortable with. And if, if there's something about that, that care that really sets, does not settle you're well with you, you're going to change it. Right. And I think that when someone is end of life care, they should be afforded every opportunity for that to be the best Absolutely. situation that, that it can be. And again, a, a lot of times it comes it comes around to talking to your staff and your and your team and making sure that your your needs because really encompassing the entire family and caregivers as well as the patients is a is a huge piece of the puzzle. Right. When you have people in and out of the homes and the patient may be happy as a lark mm -hmm. and a caregiver may come in that hasn't been there for a week and said, Why, you know, why is this not going on or was well, we didn't ask them to do it. Well, why not? So then automatically mm -hmm. there's some concern. Right. And so, so go over those situations. And if you need additional caregiving, talk that, you know, talk that through with, you don't have to do everything by yourself. Be open. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of, of guilt in our, in our, you know, I know I would feel that way. I'm a nurse. So if my husband or my mom and dad needed end of life care, you know, you just kind of feel like, well, I'm the one who should do that. Right. And, um, uh, the, the guilt involved with letting some of that go is oftentimes your worst enemy because you really do need help. I tell people all the time, you know, if I was doing, if I was setting up 24-hour care for a client where we would have caregivers in the home to do 24-hour round-the-clock care, in a week I would, hi I would hire and have to use six caregivers working 12-hour shifts to do that. And I tell families, I say, you're trying to do what six caregivers are trying to do by yourself. And it's okay to accept help and to, to really ex you know, accept the fact that you've got to get help so that you can keep yourselves healthy. Um, do you all see a lot of um, issues with spouses or family members that actually end up getting sick because they're trying to do too much? Oh all the time and we we really try to be proactive in making sure caregivers understand how important it is to take care of themselves themselves right because if if they're not there to care for their loved ones then what's going to happen and you and i've talked about this before right. uh, we see a lot of caregiver breakdown and and it we're all we're all guilty of thinking we can do everything. Yes. We've done everything. You right. get you, you get spouses that have been married for, you know, 50 60, years, 70 60 years. Right? Absolutely. Right. And they've taken care of each other. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do it. They don't want anyone else coming in to help right. out. And, and it is, you know, their, their home. You are a, a sort of an alien force coming into somebody's personal home. Right. And I do believe that's one of the advantages that you speak of when if we can get involved early, if you can get involved early, then there you can build that trust. Absolutely. Talk about the, the trust factor with something oh, like this. Trust factor is, is huge. And a lot of the resistance that we get from, from the very beginning, besides, and a lot of people really relate hospice to we're giving up there's nothing right. else we can do it's the furthest thing from that it is aggressively managing um, symptoms making sure that quality of life is the best that it can be right. but there's a lot of resistance in the beginning because number one they have that mindset or mm -hmm. they feel like they're having to especially the families they feel guilty saying to their loved ones this is what's going on now. Now we need to consider hospice. Right. It, it just is to them. It's a, just a dirty word, mm -hmm. um, which I'm very passionate about changing that Absolutely. mindset. You bet. So um, it does. It it does go back to what was the question? I'm sorry. You I totally you, you got off said track. It. You I did. Okay. Explained it. Yeah, we were just talking about some of the. You know, it's just a trust issue. Uh, the, the trust. Yes. And building sorry. that trust yes, and people yes. coming into your home and the more time you have to do that, the better off we are. Absolutely. You know. And and, and the better honestly, the experience is. The better the be. experience is, yeah. and and it, you know, statistics will even say to get the full the full benefit of hospice, a good length of stay is at least at least a couple of months. A couple of months. And and mainly because people are slow to come around to asking for for help for things or to really even understand themselves that they what may they need, need something right what right. they even need because right. they may not even know that they need 
an air bed versus yeah, well, a regular any, bed. Any type of, of support, but right. whether it be financial or whether it be um, something in, in the way of DME or whether it be a spiritual, yeah. you know, maybe we're and maybe we're making dreams and wishes come true. And the mm -hmm. earlier we can get somebody on service where they're able to to do things that they want to do to give them the best quality, they're better, the right. better off. Well, real quick before before we uh, come to an end here, what is um, a typical week? Um, in a hospice patient's life, um, what might they expect as far as visits from the hospice provider? A hospice provider, or man, I mean, if you look at what's mandated by mm -hmm. Medicare, it'll say a, a weekly nurse visit and a couple of weeks, you know, aids, a couple of days a week aid okay. visit. Um, one of the things that we really push is person-centered care and don't right. cookie cutter the care that you're providing. So it's different for everyone. Okay. If if someone is is doing is critical and what we call in stage or acuity four, they're getting a daily visit. Daily visit from um, from either a nurse or a nurse aide. Absolutely. Okay. If it's if it's somebody that just wants a nurse to come in and, and make sure that vitals and assessment and medications are in place, that may be you know once okay. a week. If they want two three days a week, if they want an aide three or four days a week, we we honestly really try to customize Tailor their plan it. of care to what is going to best suit their needs because okay. everyone is different in the amount of support that they have and caregivers right. that they have. So somebody could actually come on hospice and all they, they need is maybe a, a nurse visit once a week at first, but in the course of their service with you all, they, they'll get to the point where they might need a nurse visit every day of the week but you're able to do that as you watch the case and and assess as you progress absolutely right? we That's update really great. we update plans what about the chaplains do they do they visit is it only as requested or how that how's i that really work? encourage at least in the beginning uh, the beginning assessment to allow the chaplain to come because it's it's as much a social and supportive mm -hmm. visit as anything, anything if someone has a specific chaplain it, it, or priests that they, they like to use, they may automatically just say, well, we have our own, we don't need that. Right. I think it's just one more piece of the team that's gonna provide support. Yeah. They do, you know, it's their choice. Um, and the chaplains are the chaplains are amazing, yeah. and the bereavement coordinators are amazing, and they do really, it's it's kind of, you know, you go and, and you talk with them and you go, oh, and you leave going, wow, I'm so glad that I talked <laughs> with them because I didn't even realize. Right. So. Well, Shanna, I really appreciate you being with us today and sharing a little more today about just some of the specifics about hospice. I, I really, our point is to try to demystify this a little bit. Um, we'd like for everybody to really consider hospice as their, you know, as one of the pieces of the continuum of care. And um, I think that you've really helped us to understand more of the benefits of hospice and um, you know, how it's paid for, what's going on with it. So I appreciate you being here today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Thank you. And to our listeners and viewers, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you again today. And we hope that you will catch us again on another episode of Spotlight on Senior Issues. Thank you and have a great day.